JSC is a registered trademark of the JSC Limited. JSC Direct is an independent broadcast, not endorsed or affiliated with, nor has been authorized or otherwise approved by JSC Limited. The views expressed in this program are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect those of JSC Limited. In JSC Direct this week, stellar Capitec results, but man, that stock is expensive. Uh, we've also got Saab costs doubt on rate cuts for this year. All in gold, growth weaker. Hello and welcome to JC Direct episode 584 for 25 April. My name is Simon Brown. And yep, disclaimer up front, it's actually an old disclaimer from 2012. Uh, but I thought in the interests of like actually getting it out there in case you're confused, there it was up front, nice and simple. But let's start off with some events. We had two events since we last did a webcast, uh, podcast rather. We did the Getting Started in Shares last week with Standard Bank, the Power Hour. We also then on Tuesday this week with One Invest dug into their, their offshore. They've got a socially responsible investing one. They've got a Asia EM, which is almost kind of Asia tech. They've of course got an S&P 500 and then the InfoTech as well. The InfoTech, best ETF over, over event. Cut, cut. Just one lap.com slash latest for more details on those videos. So let's start off with Capitec results. Those results were excellent by any stretch of imagination. We had return on equity 26%, HEPs up 16%. Uh, what are we? Dividend 48 Rand 75. Active clients up 10% to 22 million. I remember when they hit 5 million and everyone's like, oh, they're not going to get to 10. Well, here they are, 22. Uh, retail bank app users up 19% at 11.2 million. Interesting footnote here. From the app, you just click a button and you've now got an easy equities account. Uh, and I should have asked Charles how big that was in their life. But, uh, well, we had so much else to talk around. All in all, really strong numbers from Capitec. No one can dispute that for a second. And truthfully, the stock has had a great uh, Tuesday, yeah, I'm recording Wednesday afternoon. Great Tuesday, um, Wednesday a little bit flat, but it is just off all-time highs, those all-time highs from uh, 2022. What struck me was cost to income, down at 39%. When they were sort of yeah, very much the low-cost space and keeping it simple and didn't have the business bank and the like, low cost to income made sense. That has been edging higher. I thought it would probably get to around the mid 40% and settle there. But as you've seen with all the big banks, they've actually managed to bring their cost to income down 39%. Difference, of course, is the other big banks all have their cost to income in the low 50s. Capitec has it in the high 30s. And payments are up. No surprises around that. Key point around that was it, what, a year or two ago, two years ago, they actually started getting a little more lending activity, kind of lowered their requirements uh, for clients. That does mean it boosted earnings, it has boosted impairments. Absolutely no surprise around that. But here's the thing this stock is expensive. Spin it how you will. So if we look at price to book, which is a, a fairly good way of looking at banks. At the bottom, we've got ABSA 0.8, NetBank 0.9 times price to book. Book is net asset value, right? We've got Standard Bank at 1.1. Uh, those are all very cheap. We've got First Round at 1.7 times price to book. Mm, that's about reasonable. We've got Capitec at 6.4 times price to book. It is uh, conceivably five or six times more expensive than its competitors, some of whom were growing earnings in the low to mid 20s, and they come in at 16%. And, okay, and then price earnings ABSA 5.9, Standard Bank 6.5, NetBank 7, First Rand 9.1, Capitec 24.9 times price earnings. This is a very expensive bank. Now, don't get me wrong. It is an excellent bank. It is a high quality. They've got great products. They're still uh, going to be rolling out their business banking. They've got that uh, MVNO, uh, Mobile Virtual Network Operator deal. 
It's doing great. They're making some money off uh, purple. I don't know how much, probably not significant amounts. Thing is, they're firing on all cylinders. They absolutely are. But in an economy which is zero growth, what are we going to do this year? One, let's be generous, 1.5% GDP growth, which is probably a little under uh, population growth of around 2%. We're going backwards as individuals. We have seen uh, employment pick up post the pandemic. That certainly helps them. But this is not a booming economy where you're like, well, of course, Capitec is going to be growing and doing excellent. They are struggling in a hard space, much like everyone else. They've got impairments rising, much like everybody else. Uh, the impairments aren't going away. Uh, I've got a sob story for you in a moment about interest rates. So this is a really, really tough space. And they are, to my mind, very expensive. They're talking about heading off to Europe. Horrendous idea. Uh, just quick aside, Mondi uh, pulled their bid for D.S. Smith because someone else came in with a higher bid. And rather than a bidding war, they said, you know what? You can have it. We would like it, but not at that price. I'm not a huge fan of, of international escapades. I have sold my Capitex. I, have, I bought them initially at 20 bucks. I bought some more at 40 bucks. This was 14, 15 years ago. I have taken my money on Capitec. I think it is a very expensive bank. Would I be shorting it? No. I mean, there's a chap on Twitter who spent his entire life shorting uh, Capitec. I don't know how he's still got money left to pay for, for data. You know, the, the reality is the market is loving that stock. And it is pushing it higher at all points in time. And therefore, you know, just don't fight. Just don't fight it. There is nothing good about fighting it. Uh, just two more events we've got coming up for May. We've got 16 May. We're doing a power hour on structured products and AMCs. It will be at Standard Bank and Webcast. We had about 80 people at the Power Hour last week. It was huge fun. Um, and there was some coffee and tea and snacks and all of that sort of thing. So it will be uh, with folks uh, or it can be webcast. And as I said, AMC's actively managed certificates. Uh, and we're going to be talking structured products as well. Uh, both well worth time. Both interesting products. I mean, the AMC's in particular. Standard Bank's got about a dozen of them. They're about 50 in total. And they're interesting products which can really help on that satellite part of a portfolio. Uh, and then we've got on the 28th of May, uh, Johan Erasmus, we're going to be chatting with what the one invest ETFs and ETNs in the commodity space. That is gold, oil, copper, and of course the PGMs, including rhodium. Just one lap.com slash events for booking. So Saab Monetary Policy, and they issue a monetary policy review which came out on Tuesday. And the short version is is it was uh, bad news. I mean, it's just bad news. There's no halfway around it. There's one picture in particular which really, really stands out as, uh, frankly, quite scary. And that is their, their, their sort of long-term inflation projection and the midpoint. So what they're showing is confidence levels of, between, of 10, 30 50 and 70 percent now obviously as you get more confident or as you get less confident your, your variances go quite wild but what it's showing and we know this from the last mpc meeting where they said you know what we're only expecting that four and a half percent late 2025 dipping below four and a half in early 26 and then moving higher again and quite notable the risk that they are seeing if you look at the bands yes the risks are that they're wrong and it's more to the downside and gets closer to three or three and a half percent but there's a lot more risk to the upside where they are wrong and it is well above six or truthfully well even touching seven percent the short answer on that means rate cuts are yo unlikely to happen uh, certainly not in the first half of this year, maybe in a September or a November meeting, I would say soonest, but certainly not before that. It is going to be it's going to be the higher for longer. We've seen that in the States as well. Uh, one of the big banks was a Bank of America, I think, maybe who came out and said they no longer expect a U.S. rate cut this year. Now, European Central Bank is saying, no worries, we're going to do one mid-year. Nice. 
but I'm I, I'm skeptical around all these rate cuts. And I, th- you know, I'd come into the year. So the the March rate cut for the US, I thought, was always off the table. I thought there was a very outside chance. We might get a March rate cut in South Africa, but I thought more likely would have been a May, but probably a July. So the March has come and gone. We've got the FOMC 30, uh, 30 April to 1 May. So that's Tuesday, Wednesday next week. And then, of course, we've got our own meetings coming later in May. We're not going to see May cuts, guys and girls. We're not going to see it happening. We're now looking at mid-year cuts. Remember, FOMC is not going to cut in September. They're not going to cut just ahead of an election. These rates are higher. And I had, I mean, one of the stocks I picked for this year in the Crystal Challenge, and I hold it, is Mr. Price on the idea that there would be some rate cuts coming uh, and helping consumers. I don't think it's going to happen. And it does, I've been bearish in banks, right? I started the year, we do that prediction podcast with uh, Mark Ashton and Keith McLaughlin. And one of my predictions was that the uh, bank index, Finney 15, would be negative for the year. So far, I'm right about that, but I think there's still some more pain. Not because they're not getting Jaws effect, not because they aren't efficient, and not because they aren't managing costs in a high inflation rate environment. They absolutely all are, but those impairments, which are already... They do what they call through the cycle. So, you know, what's the lower range of impairments in the really good days? And then what's the upper range of the impairments in the really bad days? And the short answer is they're up the, at that upper target already, some a little bit through it, and we're not out of the woods. If there is a drag on interest rates of a, a year, maybe a year and a half, well, we are conceivably end of 2025 probably as soon as before it's really through the system and we're benefiting from those lower rates, which means we've got higher impairments in 24 at the banks and higher impairments in 2025. As mentioned a moment ago with Capitec, our banks, aside from Capitec, are not expensive, but in a zero-growth environment, I don't know how they grow. I don't know how they make this really all lacquer and working. So staying with uh, some bad news, because what the heck, Sassel. Yo, 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 yo. So Sasso put out a nine-month production update, which was, I suppose you could say it was just absolutely a horror, is the short answer. Uh, and uh, the stock got absolutely pounded, over 10% down on Tuesday, uh, another 4% down Wednesday. I'm, tra- I'm recording this uh, just after 1 o'clock on Wednesday, and it is looking very, very bleak. Now, there is some support that you can sort of draw in at this area here to a degree. You could even take it a little bit lower down, that kind of 130 rand level, but I don't like it. And I know that there's a lot of folks out there saying that this is a great buy. It is an incredibly cheap stock, but as much as shorting Capitec because it's expensive is a fool's game, you know what? Buying Sassel because it's cheap might be a fool's game. That cheapness can unwind two ways, right? It can unwind by the price moving higher, of course. It can unwind by the earnings not coming back. And the big issues they've got is coal. They've environmental, we spoke, was it two weeks ago? They got the reprieve in Secunda. That's lacquer for them. But I just don't see, I don't necessarily see a great way forward. I did think that this current bounce would take them higher. But basically, the bounce that we saw has all just been wiped out. And you're now back to square one. Is this a great buy? I'm not convinced. You might think otherwise. Standard Bank has a 550 rand target price on it. Make no mistake. There are folks out there who think that this thing is the screaming deal of the century. Five and a half, 550 rand is, what, 300, 300% up from here. But does it happen? That's the point. Does it happen? I'm not sure. Quick point on Ellie's. Uh, Ellie's is finally suspended. Now, why you would buy a share that was in business rescue and then a share that was in liquidation, I don't know. But anyway, they have finally decided to suspend themselves. If you were holding shares when it was suspended, you are now part of that breakup essentially and part of the liquidation you might get a few cents on the rand i wouldn't even necessarily bet again on that i would basically write that down to zero and take that as a very very nasty lesson we've been seeing 10 cent running which uh hasn't happened for uh, quite some time so quite nice to see but 
But Tencent certainly has been having a good week. Let's be clear. When I say Tencent is running, it's been running a little bit, and it really more than anything is uh, a good week for Tencent. Let's not get completely ahead of ourselves. But it's, 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 it's run hard, and what we get from that, of course, is NASPASS and Process. Uh, NASPASS, the better of the two, but let's have a quick squiz there at Tencent. A nice little bounce there from Tencent, but this is still a stock if we take a five-year chart as well off those highs of almost 700 Hong Kong dollars now trading down at 333. If we look at price targets for consensus, uh, yo, I mean the low is 287, the mid is 420-ish, the high is 703, stock is currently 332. On the ratings, we have one strong sell, one hold, seven strong buys, and 41 buys. I mean, fair enough. I mean, I do think that this stock is cheap. I've had two conversations in my Money Web Now podcast in the last week, and one exclusively on China with Simon Fulmore from Independent uh, Securities, but then Luigi Marinas from PPS uh, as well, chatting with both of them. And, and Simon is, we spoke China, and he's saying, there's a good story here. There absolutely is. Uh, Luigi's kind of like, you know, we didn't spend as much time on China, but he's also saying, you know what, there's a decent story here. We've got a PE of 15.8. I mean, that a forward PE, that is not massively onerous for the stock in particular. And if you look at PEs and, and, and uh, sort of trends on those PEs, I mean, the, the mean over the last decade is 35 uh, forward PE is currently under 16. Uh, price to book, the mean is 8.6. Uh, current price to book is 3.5. One standard deviation below the mean is 5. It's cheap. And that's lack of good news because why? Well, if it is cheap, we start to get NASPASS and uh, process moving. And of course, NASPASS moving is extra special. Uh, well, both of them. They're in the top 40. Nice and chunky. A nice break there from NASPASS. That sort of 3,500 was important. It seems to have cleared that for now. Strong trading day yesterday. Another strong trading day today. Process kind of at that resistance point. Let's see where it goes from here. That's going to be hugely important. And then, of course, we have let's, a last touch on gold and oil. Uh, both of them have come down. Let's start to have a look at some gold here. Uh, gold is, mm, yeah, I think the word is uh, selling off. So 2315 the futures price is about 15 or $20 higher than that. It certainly is coming back. It looks like it could go back to around 2200 maybe even 2150 I continue to hold GOD. I continue to hold Anglo Gold Ashanti. A pullback is not unexpected. My target for the year is still 2500 I think that is very much possible. But nothing goes in a straight line. And if you look, I mean, gold was just green week after green week with the occasional little bit of red weeks. But gold had been absolutely running. Uh, oil is a similar story. And I look at Brent here. That's my preferred oil. We had seen it spike higher. It also on Friday jumped a fair bit. That was, frankly, on the back of the Iranian uh, attack on Israel after Israel attacked, uh, sorry, the Israeli attack on Iran after Iran attacked Israel after Israel attacked the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Yeah. It all seemed a little bit performative. It wasn't. You know, they weren't taking out nuclear reactors and stuff like that. It looked more like a case of we need to be seen to be doing. Oil obviously responded accordingly. And what we've now got uh, is oil has come back. It's rallying a bit as I'm recording this. It's back at 88. But seemingly that resistance, which is sitting at around 90 to 91 and a half, uh, is so far holding. And that is good news. Oil holding at resistance is absolutely good news. We don't want things getting too carried away here. We want it to have a nice, gentle sort of lead into it and, and an ability to come lower. And, and you know, we've got inflation problems already and that it won't go away. We've got interest rate problems and that they won't come lower. So let's not have oil really coming to spoil that party. And the question has been, what's the story with gold? Well, wars in Europe, wars in the Middle East and persistent inflation. And as long as that persistent inflation and higher rates, there is still a story for gold. That gold story has not disappeared.
Anyway, we will leave it there for this week. Uh, as always, we'll be back again next week. If you're loving the show, leave us a five-star rating on your podcatcher of choice. It helps us, uh, particularly on iTunes. But whichever you're using, it will be massively appreciated. Remember our events. We've got two of them in May. Just one app.com slash events. My name is Simon. We'll chat again next week. Until then, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well.